Um, God, we just love you so much. God, we thank you that you're here with us today. God, I thank you that you are a God who is, who is bigger than us. God, that you are a God who is bigger than our problems. You're a God that's bigger than our, our situation. God, you are a God who is bigger than us and that you have a plan, a plan of salvation and a plan to, to see your people prosper, God. And we just thank you that you're good. God, I pray that you would just give me the words to say today. God, give me the boldness to say them in the way that honors you. God, and just let us be receptive of your words today and, and lead us back to you. God, we just love you and we thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been talking about landmarks for the past however many weeks, a lot of weeks. We've been talking about landmarks. And, and to be honest, I was telling Mia before the message today, I, don't, I didn't have a good landmark story to tell you guys. You know, and she's like, well, maybe even God will give you one during worship. And I think he did. So um, my favorite landmark, one of my favorite landmarks is Dollar General. All right. <laughs> if you are a Midwestern boy like me, you know, Every good small town has a Dollar General, and the best one is found in Durand, Illinois. Um, that's the best one. That's my favorite. And the reason that I love this Dollar General is a couple reasons, right? The first time I went into this Durand, like you guys know, every small town just built a new Dollar General within the past two years, all right? And so the first time I went into the Durand um, Dollar General, I went in there, I was like, this is massive. This is everything I need. I don't have to go to Rockford or Freeport to get medicine now. I can go to Dollar General. Amen. This is awesome. Right? And then I walked out of the Dollar General and I looked across the field to like, the, looked across the street to the field that was there. And you know that feeling when you're on vacation and you're at like one of those beach shops and you walk out and you look over and there's like a beach out there and you're just like, ah, peace. That's the feeling I have whenever I walk out of Dollar General. Just peace. Like, everything is good, right? Everything's good. I got my, uh, you know, bubbler or whatever drink I have in my hand, a bag of chips, and I'm, I'm happy. And got my, you know, diapers now. Like, I'm, I'm at peace. And the reason I think that this uh, applies good to our, uh, our message today is because when you go into Dollar General the first time, you're like, wow, this is a lot bigger than I thought it was. There is so much stuff in here. I could be in here for literally like six days in a row and still have time to look at everything I want to look at, right? And that's what kind of applies to this story today we're going to talk about. It's a big story. There's a lot in it. We could be in this for a long, long time. But we're just going to go down one of the aisles today, and we're going to look at one specific aisle as we, as we study in the Bible today. Does that make sense? Is that a good landmark story or what? Amen. Thank you, God. Like, so like I said, we've been looking at landmarks in the Old Testament, and um, they have been leading us to the promised land. And we talked about um, the fall. We talked about when Adam and Eve fell and they sinned against God. We talked about God's promises to Abraham. Um, we talked about Melchizedek and how, that sh how he showed us a picture of, of who Jesus is as a different kind of high priest. And um, we talked about how um, when God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, that gives us a picture of the crucifixion and the resurrection through that story. Right? And last week we talked about how Isaac's family was messy, how Isaac's family was dysfunctional, how Isaac's family had a lot of problems, yet God still used them to move the promise forward. Right? They, car they carried that dysfunction forward, but they also carried the promise forward with them as well, and God still used them. Today we're going to continue in the story um, on the path to the promised land uh, by, and by looking at the story of Jacob's sons, and specifically Joseph. Um, so if you want to open up your Bibles to Genesis um, chapter 37, if you know the story of Joseph, you know that this is a long story. There's a lot of, a lot of chapters in this story. Um, it starts with thir Genesis chapter 37, then we take a little detour in Genesis 38 with Judah and Tamar, but then Genesis 39 through 50 are all the story of, of Joseph. So we're going to be here for, like I said, a long time. No, just kidding, right? We're not looking at the whole story today, every little detail of Joseph. We're going to go down one of the aisles, and I think it's the snack aisle, because there's going to be a lot of food for thought today. Amen? God is so good. He's so good. This is how you know none of this stuff is from me, because I did not have that. None of this is written down. It's good stuff. All right. Um, so we're obviously not going to have enough time to read the whole story, right? So I encourage you when you do go home this week to go sit down sometime and read Genesis 37 through 50, right? And there's a lot of good stuff in there, and it's not that hard of a read, right? If there's names you don't know, just skip over it like I do, right? It's not that bad. But I can't encourage you to go home and read the story because there's a lot that we're not going to be able to talk about today that is um, good stuff. But we are going to begin today by reading Genesis chapter 37. So you're not getting out of listening to me read. I'm going to read a lot today, but just not the whole thing. All right, so Genesis chapter 37, verse 1. I encourage you to follow along in your paper Bibles or on your phones. or should be on the screen behind me as well. It says, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the count of Jacob's family line. 
Joseph, a young man um, of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the son of Bilhah and the son of Zilpha, his father's wives. He brought the, their fathers a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. He made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him, and they could not speak, any, speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream that went... And when he told his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood up while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And then this time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his, fathers were, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. And verse 12 says, Now his brothers had gone to get, graze their father's flocks near, near Shechem, and And Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing their flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks, and bring word back to me that he had sent him from the... Then he had sent him from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I am looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, said the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dorthon. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dorthon. But they saw him in a distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes from his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood, he said. He don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing. And when they took him, they threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty and there was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, which is kind of, you know, mean. Don't throw your brother into a cistern and then eat a meal. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a, a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gil- Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to, on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said, said to his brothers, what, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover, up his, and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hand on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianites merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for, for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw Joseph was not there, he tore, off his, he tore his clothes, and he went back to his brothers and said, The boy isn't here. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, We've found this. Examine it to see whether it's your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph, Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his, office, tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I would join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph into Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of, of the guard. All right, so as we read that chapter, right, as we read that chapter of Joseph's story, many of you guys have probably heard this story before. Many of you guys have probably read this story before. Um, But as I read this, I begin to see so many parallels to the story of Jesus Christ. I'm reading this, this chapter, and I see so many parallels to the story of Jesus Christ, and I think it's important for us to take a second to stop and to say, what, where, where does this line up, right? What is, what is the same? What is different? And I want to look at that today with you guys, if you're, on, if you're on board with that. All right, you guys good with that? All right. 
All right, like I said, there's a lot of parallels, right? We talked about Abraham and Isaac and how God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac and how that paralleled the crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, how Isaac was basically dead and then God provided a savior for him, a ram to take his place, right? Joseph was a shepherd. Joseph's story also parallels Jesus' life in many ways, right? Joseph was a shepherd, and Jesus is called the good shepherd. Now, I know that's like a super basic one, and we're like, yeah, there's a lot of shepherds in the Bible. Not all of them pick, like, picture Jesus, right? But that's, that's what I want to start with, because some of these are really, really rock solid, and these are like, man, this is, this is a parallel to Jesus. Some of them are a little bit less, where it's like, this could be a parallel to Jesus, and some of them are like, okay, that's kind of a stretch. Maybe that one's not a parallel to Jesus, right? It's our job as, as people who believe in the Bible, people who believe in Jesus Christ, that we, that we look at this honestly, right? That we're not trying to make it say something it doesn't say, but we see what it actually says, right? So it's not just that he was a shepherd. There's so much more, right? It tells us that Israel loved Joseph more than he loved his other brothers. Matthew 3, 17, when Jesus was baptized, it says, and a voice came from heaven and said, this is my son who I'm loved. With him, I'm well pleased. Joseph was the loved and chosen son from Jacob, Jesus is the loved and chosen son of God, right? It says Joseph was hated by his brothers, right? Because he had brought a bad report about them to his father, right? So basically the way it worked back then is all these shepherds would go out in the field, right? And they'd be out in the field for a long, long time. And then the dad would be like not see his kids for a while. So he'd send someone to go get a report on how they were doing. Joseph came back one day and said, yeah, they're not doing good. They're doing whatever they're doing. It's a bad report, right? He gave a bad report about them. Right? Joseph gave a bad report about his brothers. They hated him. But Jesus, right? it says that Jesus in, in John 7, 7, it says, the world cannot hate you because it hates me, because I testify that its works are evil. Right? Joseph was hated by his brothers because he gave a bad report about them. Jesus was hated by the people of this world because he gives a bad report about sin. Right? Joseph was brought a bad report about his brothers. They hated him. Jesus bad, brought a bad report about the world, and the world hated him because of that. Does that make sense? Jesus comes and he tells people, hey, you need to repent your sins. You're, you're doing things wrong. That's a bad report. They, people don't like being told they're doing things wrong, right? And they hated him because of it, right? Joseph's own brothers hated him, right? Jesus' own people hated Jesus, right? John 1, 11 says he came, to the, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Joseph was rejected by his brothers. Jesus was rejected by his own people, Joseph tells his brothers about the dream that he had one day, right? And that they would bow down to him, that they would bow down to him. And Jesus tells the people when he's doing his ministry that one day, right, I'm, I'm going to take authority, right, and you're going to be bowing down to me. Philippians 2.10 um, verse 11 through 11 says that, at, let me slow down. I'm, there's a lot I want to go through today, so I'm trying to go in really quick, so let me slow down a little bit. Right, Philippians 2.10, verse 11, um, 2.10, 11 says, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in, he in heaven and on earth and under the sun, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory and the God of the Father, right? Every knee shall bow to Jesus, right? And Joseph tells the brothers that you will bow down to me one day, right? Do you see the parallel here? And then one thing we need to be careful about, like, careful about, like I said, is that we don't need to over-project things that aren't necessarily true, in the second dream, it, Joseph says his, all of his brothers and his mom and dad are going to bow down to him, right? But does this mean that God the Father is going to bow down to Jesus the Son? No, right? That's not what it means. I think what this is saying here is it's talking about how even Jacob will bow down to Jesus, right? When we talked about Melchizedek, we talked about how Melchizedek blessed Abraham, and Abraham gave Melchizedek, Melchizedek a tithe, right? And this was to show that Melchizedek was greater than Abraham because the greater blesses the lesser, Right? And Jesus was a new, new type of priest in the order of Melchizedek, right? and he was greater than Abraham. Does that make sense? Right? And what I think this is, dream is saying is not only will all the brothers bow down to Jesus one day, but Jacob will bow down to, to Jesus as well. And this is important because you have to understand that for the Israelites, for the Jewish people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were like the patriarchs of their faith. Right? They were like the big deal in their faith. And it's important to know that even they bow down to Jesus. Right? All of them bow down to the name of Jesus. Right? And then the story continues, and uh, next Joseph goes out and he checks on his brothers. And when he's going out to the field to check on them, they see him from a distance, and they conspire this plan that they're going to kill him. They said, we're going to kill our brother, our brother Joseph. Right? And this should remind us of the story of Jesus, when the Pharisees and the people of the, of the Jewish leaders conspire to kill Jesus. 
Matthew 27, verse 1 says, Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed, right? They threw Joseph into a cistern, and when they saw a caravan coming towards them, Judah had the idea to sell Joseph to them for 20 shekels, right? You remember how much Jesus was sold from Judas? 30 shekels, inflation. (laughs) All right, that's good. Jesus was sold for for 30 shekels of of silver. Joseph was sold for 20 shekels of silver, right? Do you know Judah was the one who said, that was my idea, let's sell him, right? Who was the person that sold Jesus? Judas, right? Judas is is just a different way of saying Judah. It's like the Greek way of saying Judah, right? So Judah and Judas, they both sell Joseph and Jesus, right? And and they sell Joseph into a slave. You see the parallels here, right? You see how that's pretty cool? Right? And then we see the imagery. We see the caravan, they're carrying embalming spices. They're heading to Egypt, they're carrying embalming spices, right? For when people die, embalming spices. And they're carrying myrrh, right? And the imagery here is, is very obvious to me. The imagery of Joseph in the cistern, in the pit, right? The imagery of them bringing embalming spices to Egypt, right? The imagery of death and how Joseph was basically dead, right? He was thrown into the pit. The pit represents death so many times in the Bible. When it says God pulls us from the pit, right? That's pulling us, pulling us from death. Joseph was in the pit. He was basically dead, right? To everyone else except those 12 brothers, those 11 brothers, they knew Joseph was dead, right? He was in the pit. And then these people are bringing myrrh to Egypt. Myrrh, why is myrrh, myrrh significant in the story of Jesus? What did they bring Jesus when he was born? Myrrh. What did they put on Jesus after he died? Myrrh, right? You see how all these things together, you go, man, this is starting to give us a picture of Jesus. This is starting to point us towards Jesus, right? Then his brothers, they, they dipped Joseph's coat in, in the goat's blood and they gave it to his dead. And now Joseph is basically dead in the eyes of his father, right? He's basically dead. For all he knows, he's dead, all right? Then Joseph is sold to Potiphar, right, an officer of Egypt, and right away Potiphar puts Joseph in charge of all of his households. This is where we don't have time to read the whole story because we'll be here for a long time, right? So I'm just going to summarize it for you guys a little bit. But Joseph's been put in charge of all of Potiphar's house things as a slave, right? He's a slave. He works himself up. He shows that he's faithful, that he does a good job. Whatever he does is blessed. So Potiphar puts him in charge of everything. It says Potiphar's only worry about about what he was going to eat, isn't that nice? That's like my life with me as my wife. My only worry is what am I going to eat for dinner, right? She does everything else. No, I'm just kidding. I, I, I help a little bit. Um, but all he had to worry about was like, what am I going to eat? Because Joseph was in charge of everything, right? And then if we know the story, we know Potiphar, Potiphar's wife is trying to get Joseph to, to sleep with her because Joseph's a good looking dude, right? So Potiphar's wife is trying to get Joseph to sleep with her. And it doesn't say that it's just one time. It says over and over again, right? It says day after day, Joseph refused to sleep with her, right? And this is significant because, right, we know Joseph was tempted. That's a temptation, if you read the book of Genesis, you see the sexual temptation that everyone goes through. There is like not very many people who like re- refuse that temptation, right? Read the book, like we talked about Jacob's family last, last week about how he was married to this woman, then he was married to this woman, then he had like babies with this woman's slave and then babies with that woman's slave and they, they just all gave into this temptation. Joseph didn't give into this temptation. And the cool thing about Joseph's story is outside of maybe Daniel, He's like one of the only people in the Old Testament, when you read their story, that they don't have a major downfall, right? Think of anyone in the Old Testament. Think of David, major downfall, right? Think of Saul, major downfall. Think of Samson, major downfall. Even Moses, major downfall, right? All these people had some major sin in their life, major downfalls. But with Joseph, we're not told of any of his major downfalls. We're not told of his sin. What we are told of is when he refused that temptation, Right? And we know that Joseph's not perf- perfect, right? We know that all men fall sor- short of the glory of God. Joseph's not perfect. He does sin. But we're told of his refusal of that temptation over and over again, right? And we know that Jesus was tempted. Jesus was tempted for 40 days. He fasted for 40 days, went into the wilderness, was tempted by the devil, right? And Jesus resisted that temptation. In Hebrews 4, 4 15, it says, for we do not have a high priest who is un." unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. 
Jesus was tempted in every single way that we have been. Jesus was tempted in every single way that Joseph was tempted, but Jesus did not sin, right? And Joseph did not fall into that temptation. Yet, if we know the story of Joseph, right, we know Potiphar's wife was not very happy about this, right? And she claims that Joseph was trying to sleep with her, gets Joseph wrongly convicted, throws him in him to prison, right? Does that sound familiar? Someone who was not, refused, to tempt, refused temptation, right, was wrongly convicted and wrongly punished for something he did not do, right? That's Jesus. That's what, exactly the story of Jesus. Lived a perfect life, resisted temptation, yet he was wrongly accused and wrongly convicted on something that he did not do, right? And in fact, the reason that Joseph was put in a jail was not because he sinned, well, it, was, it was because Potiphar's wife was sin, sinned. So Joseph was paying the punishment of someone else's sin, Right, and Jesus, like the reason he was crucified wasn't because he messed up, but it was because we sin, right? Our sin put Jesus on the cross, right? And Potiphar's wife's sin put Joseph in jail, right? You see the parallels there? You see them? Yeah, very cool. I think it's really cool. Maybe you don't. I think it's like amazing, right? I think it's so cool that God would put together a book, a story in the Bible that shows us Jesus' life and the path to salvation. But it doesn't stop there, right? It continues and it keeps going. And it says, and it talks about while Joseph was in prison and he goes into this prison and he's put in charge of the prison, right? He is so well liked. He does such a good job in the prison that he's put in, in charge of the prison. All authority on his, of the prison is put onto him. Right? And just like at Potiphar's, Potiphar's house, all authority was given to him. Right? And just like Jesus is given all authority, Matthew 28, 18 says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Right? No matter where Jesus is, he has all authority on heaven and on earth. No matter where Joseph went and worked, he was given authority over all the stuff. Right? And then while in prison, Joseph interprets the dreams of an Egyptian cupbearer and a baker. And he tells the, the cupbearer, he has a dream, and he says that, you know, in three days, you're, you're going to be lifted up. You're going to be freed from prison. You're going to be lifted up back to your spot and, 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 and serving the Pharaoh. And the baker, he hears this interpretation, and he's like, hey, I just had a dream too. Like, maybe you should interpret my dream. And Joseph tells him, yeah, in three days, you're going to be lifted up too, except you're going to be put on a spike, and you're going to be killed, and the birds are going to eat your flesh, right? Not a good, not a good outcome for the baker, Amen. Right, so they, these two guys have their dreams. He's convicted, Joseph's convicted in jail with these two guys. One of them's gonna be lifted up and be saved and, and put back in his position. The other one's killed on the, killed, I almost said on the cross, right? Killed on a stake, right? Jesus was convicted with two, two felons, right? One who said, Jesus, like, forgive me, right? And Jesus said, for surely, you're gonna be in paradise with me today. He was saved. The other one who laughed and mocked and who died that day, right? You see the parallels there of the two people, and then the story continues and years go on, years go by, and then the, the Pharaoh has a dream. And the cupbearer remembers that Joseph interpreted his dream. And he says, hey, I know someone who can interpret your dream, Pharaoh. So they bring Joseph out and, and Joseph interprets the, the Pharaoh's dream, right? And then the dream is basically saying there's gonna be seven years of, of plenty, seven years of abundance, seven years of really good of harvest. Then there's gonna be seven years of famine, seven years of really hard time, right? Seven years where there's not gonna be enough. You know, Joseph interprets that dream for, for Pharaoh, and he says it's not because I can do it, but because God can do it, right? And then after that, Joseph's put in charge. The Pharaoh sees that, that Joseph's right, and he puts Joseph in charge of that, that whole situation, right? And that brings us to Genesis 42. And now I know I'm going through this really, really quick because there's a lot in here, and it's good stuff. Like I said, you have to go home and read it. But that brings us to Genesis 42, all right? And we're gonna read Genesis 42, um, one through nine. And it says, when Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there is no grain in Egypt. There is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Then 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt, but Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others, because he was afraid that harming, that the harm might come to him. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain for, for these, for there was a famine in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold the grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to the ground, when their faces, with their faces to the ground, fulfilling that dream. And as soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger, and he spoke harshly to them. Where do you come 
from, he asked, from the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy some food, right? Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dream about them, and he said to them, you are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. So Joseph, right, has his brothers come to him, has his brothers come to Egypt, They're, the famine's in their land. He comes to Egypt where he's in charge of the whole, the whole process of getting food. He's in charge of the whole process of selling the food, and his brothers come to him, and they don't recognize him, right? The reason they don't recognize him is because he was 17 when he was thrown into the cistern, and it says that he was about 30 years old when he started this position in charge of everything in Egypt. Guess who else was 30 years old when he started his ministry? Jesus right? You see these little tiny cool, tiny cool like connections that are over and over again in the story. And it makes you think maybe this is a little bit different than what we learned in Sunday morning on, on um, you know, kid zone or Sunday, Sunday school. Maybe there's more to this. Maybe this story is a big dollar general, right? But if we look down the aisles, there's more of this that, that, that points us to Jesus, right? And they come to Joseph and they ask for some food, right? And Joseph at first is like, where's my brother Benjamin? Like, I don't see my brother Benjamin. I'm going to mess with him a little bit. Like, you guys are spies. I, you're not, you know, I'm not going to give you the food right away, right? Then he sends them back with food, right? And, and he saves them, right? They, they don't recognize him, but he recognizes them. And the brothers bow down to Joseph just as he did in the dream. And that leads us to, Gen- to Genesis chapter 45, Right? And this is like the, the climax of the story. This is like the payoff of everything that's happened so far in, in Joseph's life. Genesis chapter 45, verse 1, it says, Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants. And he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's house, household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. It is, my, my father still living, is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one who sold you into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. But because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you, For two years now, there has been a famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God, whom he made my father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household and ruler of Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me, you and your children and your grandchildren, your flocks and your herds and all you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to it will become destitute. Salvation. What is the story of Joseph about? What is all that chapters 39 through 50 about in the story of of Joseph? And it's salvation. It's a story of salvation. When you read it, you look at the details. You're like, there's so many different lessons we can learn. There's so many lessons about how not to treat your brother. There's so many lessons you can learn about like when you're in a bad situation, how to rely on God and how he'll bring you out of that situation. But the story of Joseph altogether is about the salvation of God's people. Right, the salvation of God's people. If Joseph wasn't in this position in Egypt, if he wasn't in the position to have all authority in Egypt, more than likely, it's very likely that God's people would have starved and they would have died and they wouldn't have had that salvation. But what Joseph does for them is he gives them a way to salvation. He gives them food that they need so that they can live, right? They come, they, they, they don't recognize who Joseph was. He tells them, hey, I'm your brother, I'm your brother. I love you, I forgive you. I want you guys to come live with me in Egypt so that you can live and you can continue to, to strive, right? And after that, the whole tribe of Israel, it was about 70 men and women and children, 70 people came to Egypt and they lived there in Egypt and it was good. And it was good and they were saved from the famine, right? 
the story of Joseph, all of this stuff that happened, all the ups and downs, right? Him being put, thrown into a cistern, him being slow, sold as a slave, him being wrongly accused and thrown into prison, right? Him sitting in prison for two extra years because the cupbearer forgot about him, right? Him coming to Pharaoh and saying, interpreting the dream, and then him being appointed the second in command of all of Egypt, all the ups and downs, right? All of this happened so that Joseph could save God's people from death. Do you see where this is going? You see this where this is going? Jesus did the same thing for us. Jesus does the same thing for us. God sent his son to come to this earth, right, born of a virgin, to live a perfect life, to live a perfect life, to be hated. Jesus was hated by his own people, rejected by his own people, right, to be hated, to be wrongly accused of things that he did not do, to go through a, a, a false conviction trial, right, to be put, tortured and put on a cross to die for our sins so that three days later that he can raise again, right? Why would he do that? Why did he go through all that? for salvation, to save his people, right? Jesus did all this to save his people. Worship team, if you guys wanna come up. The difference between Jesus and, and Joseph is, is something that we need to understand as well. In the Old Testament, there's these pictures of Jesus that it shows us, right? The picture of Isaac and Abraham, the picture of Joseph, right? But these people are not the perfect savior, right? Their salvation is temporary. Joseph's salvation of Israel was temporary. They lived in, in Israel or in, in Egypt for a while. It was good. They had an abundance of food. They strived and they lived like it was really, really good. But then generations came by and a new Pharaoh came in who didn't know Joseph, who didn't know Joseph. And then he said, hey, these Israelites are too strong. There's too many of them. Let's put them into slavery, right? Joseph's salvation was temporary, right? It was temporary. It was just for a couple generations, right? God saved him for just a couple of generations. But through Jesus, through Jesus, salvation is final. It's finished, right? It's all we need. It's the perfect salvation. Jesus is the perfect savior, the one that God had planned from the very beginning, Right from the very beginning with Adam and Eve, God had a plan for the perfect savior. Right when God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, God had a perfect plan for the perfect salvation. And then with Joseph, when he went through all those ups and downs, right, God had a perfect plan for the salvation of his people. Right, a perfect plan for the salvation of his people. Right, in Joseph's story, we see God's in control the whole time. Everything that happens, God is in control. Right, when Joseph's in, in slavery, God's in control. When Joseph's in jail, God's in control. When Joseph's in Egypt, God's in control, right? And the goal is not to be powerful and rich in Egypt. That's not the goal. The goal was to have salvation of his people, of God's people, and God's in control. In Jesus' story, we see God is in control, and he had a plan of salvation for his people from death, right? It's important to know God's plan wasn't for Jesus to come here on earth and set up his kingdom right away and to be powerful and rich and famous and for everyone to bow and worship him at that time. God's plan was for salvation of his people, Right? And that's what Jesus does for us. Just like, Jove, just like Joseph saves his family from the famine, God saves his people from death, for an eternal death, right? And gives us life and forgiveness of sins. God is so good, amen. Hey, let's, let's stand and pray as we, as we turn, go into worship. God, we just love you so much. God, we thank you that you are good. And I thank you for the story of Joseph that points us to Jesus and the salvation plan that you've had from the beginning. God, I thank you that you are God who has a plan of salvation for us. And that plan was Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for us, God, a, a death that he did not deserve, that he took our place so that we can have salvation in him and live forever with you, God. We just thank you for this and we worship you because of it. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.